Um, thank you so much, Oliver, and to Chris uh, and everybody else involved in the organizing of this. I think it's a really timely moment to think about this question of freedom and liberation and autonomy uh, in the, along the lines that your opening video suggested. And, and I, as you can tell from my title, what I want to do here is something really quite straightforward and broad brush, which is to defend a, a quite traditional concept of the, of the notion of, of autonomy, understood as a combination of nomos or law and self or autos, um, broadly in terms of a, a defense of popular sovereignty, the idea of collective self-rule, which I think we can do if we take for granted here an, an understanding of the law as a, a, a kind of capacity to issue a sovereign or binding command that applies to all the members of a, of a situation or of a community. So the law part of, the, of autonomy seems to me fundamental and relatively clear, or at least it should be clear. You know, the capacity to issue laws that might abolish slavery or exploitation or limit the length of the working day or to ensure equal access to justice or education or healthcare and so on. Uh, and of course, then we can understand also the resistance to such laws, the attempts to evade them or to qualify them or to wriggle out of them and so on. Um, so if the, if the law part is clear, the, the, the question of, this, uh, of the autos or self is not. Um, so if a sovereign command is clear enough, and it's clear already in Hobbes or Baudin and later in Rousseau and others, the big question is really who is the sovereign? What sort of self is a sovereign? What sort of autos is a sovereign? And what sort of relations does a sovereign actor entertain with other actors and also uh, with itself? So that would be kind of the guiding thread of this, that is the autos is a, is a problematic concept, even if the law isn't necessarily one. So as a point of departure to insist on the autonomy in terms of collective self-legislation or collective self-rule would have been uh, totally uncontroversial. Um, I'm not an expert on this at all on ancient philosophy, but it, it seems that from all the collective surveys I've read, that they agree that the, in ordinary usage in antiquity, autonomy just referred to those cities or communities that were self-governing or freely self-determining, communities that could prescribe their own laws, live by them. So even if they weren't technically sovereign in the rather distinctive modern state sense of the term, they were uh, broadly sovereign or self-determining in the sense of obeying their own laws rather than being subject to the laws of another power. Whereas the term almost never referred to, at least not in its initial usage, to something that would be more personal or private, something like personal self-rule. So, which is precisely, of course, the modern connotation. And the point is illustrated, and I'll just to refer back to the image that Chris had on his opening screen here from Antigone, the line in 817 of Sophocles' play, where she's referred to by the chorus as autonomous, guided, and that's translated in different versions as guided by your own laws or answering only to her own law. And that could be read as a kind of reference to some kind of private law of Antigone. But of course, she herself makes very clear that the law that she's obeying is not in any sense her own in some sort of personal sense, but on the contrary is deeper and more fundamental kind of divine law, the laws of the gods that are unwritten and unfailing, she puts it from time immemorial and so on. Um, so the, the early the ancient concept of, of autonomy seems fairly straightforward and it remains a notion then that goes into eclipse uh, along with the idea of self-governing states with the rise of Rome and subsequent empires and later notions of feudal deference and fealty and so on. And the, the notion of autonomy kind of falls out of the political lexicon until it comes back with the crisis precisely of those feudal and kind of pre-reformation concepts of political order. And it comes back into usage, as I understand it, at least broadly, again, in terms of as the OED puts it, in terms of the right or condition of self-government of a state, community, or institution. And it's only later in the 19th century that it migrates on to have this connotation more with personal liberty, with all the things we've discussed already around, as I have Berlin, negative liberty, freedom from constraint, and so on. And this is a very important shift, of course, because it introduces a, you know, a major ambiguity in the term, and it, and it both expands and contracts it, it opens it up to this bewildering variety of actors that can lay claim to it today from embattled indigenous militants to right-wing libertarians and pretty much everything in between. Um, but generally with, uh, with an emphasis on the particularity and independence of these actors in relation to other actors. So you take a more sympathetic example like Extinction Rebellion encouraging its local affiliates or groups to quote, act autonomously um, so long as they remain consistent with the broad principles of the group. 
and as a result, this term autonomy has become, I think, very equivocal and, and, and hard to pin down. And you can see a symptom of it in, that, in the phrase that I used for my title of what it means now to be a law unto yourself or a law unto oneself. And of course, the contemporary usage will condemn this with good reason, of course, as characteristic of actors who flout the law or ignore the law or take the law into their own hands, uh, as when we say of you know, the police who are a law unto themselves or corporations, or oil companies, and so on, who act as if they're law unto themselves. Uh, but the original usage, as I understand it, going back, you know, goes back, I think, to St. Paul. Chris might know this better than me. Um, and uh, from the Romans, letter to the Romans, chapter 2, 14, where he's unequivocally positive about those people, those Gentiles, who, have, who haven't received the law, the Jewish law, but nevertheless can abide by its spirit and therefore act rightly and with integrity. They are a law unto themselves, meaning they don't need a law to be given to them. They, they act as if autonomously, so to speak. It doesn't use the term, but I think it's, again, the broadly the meaning. Um, and the idea of being a law unto ourselves is simply the concept of democracy, as I understand it, that we, the people, whatever, however we define that, we'll come back to this, uh, should have the power and should lay claim to the power to lay down a law as we see fit and make sure that everybody obeys it. And in particular, uh, sort of anticipating Rousseau here, in particular, those groups who have an interest in evading it, namely privileged groups, the rich, dominant class, the government that might rule on behalf of a dominant class and so on. So if, if, if the term has become, uh, you know, tricky and elusive and contested, it's because I think the, the auto, the autos, the self in autonomy uh, is itself a complicated idea. It is, if, if there ever was a slippery idea in philosophy, this is one of them. You know, what is a self? Uh, it's much more ambiguous a term than the idea of the one that you might get in the mono of monarchy. Or, um, you know, the, the idea of self-rule, you could translate just as well as autocracy rather than autonomy. And again, for a long time, that was uncontroversial and done. So according to the Oxford English Dictionary, from the early 17th century through to the mid 19th century, autocracy was just a synonym really of autonomy, meaning independent power or self-rule. And it only comes to acquire its modern connotation of despotic or absolute government uh, in the 19th century, again, at precisely that time when autonomy shifts over to its liberal or merely personal dimension. And that's, I think, quite a suggestive shift that there's not space to go into, and I don't know the semantic history of this well enough, but it seems well worth um, exploring. Um, so still with a figure like Kant, for example, uh, Kant, of course, emphasizes autonomy as the central idea in the sense of his whole moral philosophy, but he's also quite happy to invoke as its complement autocracy, he uses the term several times, or self-mastery as something that is required to supplement our capacity for autonomy. Autocracy then, and there's a useful study here by, by Anne Baxley, another by Paul Geyer, uh, would be the, the acquisition of the virtue or strength of character required to actually lay down and follow the moral law. So what, what shifts from, say, Kant's affirmation of autocracy to, say, the autocracy that becomes famous or notorious with, with the czars of Russia and other absolute rulers, exemplified, say, by Nicholas II, the last czar, who repeatedly invokes autocracy as his divine right, is that the relation between the self of the ruler and those, uh, the ruler rules uh, changes fundamentally. In Kant, that relation is, is, a, is a homogeneous one, if you like. They remain one and the same actor in the logic of obedience to one's own self-imposed laws. Whereas with the czar, they become as disconnected as they could be. The czar is utterly transcendent of the people. He rules above them in something like the way an immortal god is above all mortal beings. So the, the critical thing here is that the concept of the self, and I hope that you know, we could demonstrate this with reference to all kinds of thinkers and re recurs self as another, but going back through South and Fanon to Hegel and Kant, the self is a relational category, fundamentally. It has this irreducibly relational dimension to it. I think in the ancient usage as much as in more modern ones, a self can only be thought, I think, in relation to an other or others, and also in relation to itself, including to itself as an other. Um, and it's the ambiguity around this, the dynamics of the relationship that I think are fundamental. And you can see that again in another term that I think is interesting to compare to autonomy, which is that of automation, where what's at stake again, I think, is the quality of the relation between the auto of this automation, the self-moving, uh, which 
gives us, of course, automobile or car, but really has its origins in the Industrial Revolution with the development of self-moving machinery, exemplified by the, the self-acting spinning mule, for example. And here this develops in line with Marx's point, often quoted, very important though, about machinery and automation in general. This is from Capital Volume 1, and it's page 562 if you want to track this down later. I'm sorry, I don't have slides here or um, anything for you to read. I'll just read it slowly. He says famously, machinery, and he, so here he broadly means automatic, you know, self-driving tools in the, in the sense of um, industrial machinery. Machinery does not just act as a superior competitor to the worker, always on the point of making him superfluous. It's a power inimical to him. And capital proclaims this fact loudly and deliberately, as well as making use of it. It is the most powerful weapon for suppressing strikes, these periodic revolts of the working class against the autocracy of capital. And he goes on to talk about specifically the, the spinning mule and also the steam engines and so on. Um, and it's this relation here, in fact, between the automation of the technology, like the steam engine and the self-spinning, uh, self-acting spinning mule, that, that gives capital a, a, a capacity to overcome the autonomy of the workers and therefore establish their autocracy. So we kind of link our three terms together. And to flesh that out, although there's not time to do it here, I'd encourage you to look at Andreas Malm's really superb book on fossil capital which develops this in some detail. He looks at how, he asks himself, if you don't know the book, uh, the question, why does steam power, uh, why is steam power adopted the way that it is in the first decades of the 19th century in the British, specifically the English cotton mills? You know, why, when in fact water power, you know, good old fashioned water wheels were still cheaper, in fact a lot cheaper. And he says, well, because it allows the, the owners of capital to overcome the autonomy first of nature itself of, of the, the fact that they can't control entirely the natural sources of power, wind and water and so on. And also, and more importantly, to overcome the autonomy of the workforce, which as long as the workforce could be on its own space, so to speak, always had a certain degree of power. Whereas once you have a mobile source of power, once you could shift that to a spot where capital is strong and where labor is weak, where, for example, labor uh, is, is impoverished and destitute and, and requires, you know, has to work basically on any terms, then it gives capital an immense force of leverage. And Mom, and this is so Mom, M A L M, if you don't know the book, shows and really in some detail how as capital develops and the, the tools, inventions that, you know, building on Watt, steam engine, and so on, a whole sort of set of forms of automated mechanical power that precisely. Uh, overrule the, the, the autonomy of labor. So what steam engines and other forms of automated machinery give you are perfectly docile, subservient tools that you can use to overcome and control more intractable elements of production, in particular labor. So the automated mechanism source of power is utterly submissive to capital and it gives capital's autocracy leverage over the once semi-autonomous workforce. And Mark, my mom quotes uh, another line from Marx, from the Grundrisse, which notes that when capital begins, it relies on the crutches of past modes of production. In other words, it's not yet autocratic. It can't yet rely on its own laws, if you like. But as it matures, quote, it throws away the crutches and moves in accordance with its own laws. So capital becomes precisely autonomous and autocratic in the same sense of the of that term, it prescribes its own laws, it, it imposes them, it obeys them, it forces everybody else to obey them. And Marx can then quite rightly spend the, the bulk of the rest of his life looking up these laws of motion, how they work, how they are applied, how capital maintains this command over unpaid labor as its essential definition. Um, so all, all of that is a kind of initial preamble about, about the auto of uh, autocracy what is, uh, and automation and autonomy itself. What's critical is the relation. In this case, for example, the relation that capital has to labor, the relation between the autocratic dimension of, of, of capital, its desire to command, and labor's attempt to resist that, its own, to, to impose its own autonomy in the face of capital. All right, well, uh, with that preamble kind of out of the way, if we move on now to autonomy, and roughly what I want to say, or make some general points about the notion of how it comes into being, and, and the, particularly on the restrictions that apply to it as a kind of general political concept. And then I want to say a word very briefly about the three kind of obvious, in a sense, 
figures in canonical European philosophy on this, who are Kant, Hegel, and Rousseau, respectively. And it's probably very familiar stuff. And, and I um, also, of course, it gets complicated once you get into the detail of the history of philosophy like that. So I'll do that in a super schematic way. It'll be very, very broad brush. Um, but I hope it's at least something to, to, frame a, <clears throat> to frame a more general point. So on the question of autonomy, as we, I mentioned before, it goes into a kind of eclipse uh, and reemerges then um, in the kind of catastrophic consequences of the Reformation and the wars of revolution and the sort of general collapse and crisis of all traditional forms of authority and control. That, that meant that by the time that, say, Hobbes comes along, writing in the midst of now England's civil war, um, say traditional Tory conservative forms of authority are no longer adequate to maintaining social order and you need something else. There's got to be some sort of acknowledgement of the role of the subjects of the state. Uh, it, at the very least, the state has to find a way to solicit their consent and perhaps more than that, their participation in the, in the legislation or the lawmaking that governs the state. So in one way or another, there's an acknowledgement that runs, I think, from Hobbes to Locke to Rousseau and so on, that there's no avoiding this dimension of popular consent and that increasingly it becomes the explicit form of legitimacy, at least in a kind of mainstream European context. And I think you could show that this does indeed happen, um, but it happens, and a, this is a big qualification, subject to three, at least three really major restrictions. Um, all of which I think again are fairly obvious. First of all, this domain of voluntary consent, if you like, or, or quasi autonomy, popular participation in the laws that they obey, something like this. An, an acknowledgement of that principle uh, is restricted to the political equivalent of say, white rational adults. In other words, property owning Europeans primarily, who inhabit what we could call precisely a kind of specific historical geographic zone of autonomy, autonomous zone, where the, the basic logic of this um, is framed in terms of, well, people have a right to participate in, in the making of the laws that govern them, insofar as the laws are indeed an expression of the will of the sovereign. So you could expand the concept of the sovereign to include a, a kind of version of the people understood as the bearers of a certain will, so long as you can control the definition of who has a will. So someone like Locke, a useful point of reference here, and part of Chatterjee rightly draws attention to this in several places. Locke says, you can't have legitimate power without popular consent. You know, he says uh, in his second treatise, man being, as has been said, by nature, all free, equal, and independent. So all men, at least men, are free, equal, and independent. Therefore, no one can be put out of his estate and subjected to the political power of another without his own consent. So for the same reason, you can't be taxed without consent. This is an idea that goes well back into parliamentary history. Uh, and uh, the, a person who qualifies as free, equal, and independent, therefore has the right to be governed by their own consent. But there are people who don't qualify as free, equal, and independent because they don't have, if you like, a will of their own. The equivalent, as Locke puts it, of idiots or imbeciles or children, madmen. Um, and this is in the context of this discussion of the relations between parents and children. And it's essentially then a, 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 the implication that there are the political equivalent of children who lacking a will can't be reasonably expected to govern themselves and need instead to be governed by the political equivalent of their parents. And this argument can then be used, as Chatterjee shows quite convincingly, by a whole slew of people, including, well, Kant and Hegel for one thing, but also J.S. Mill, the new liberals, Hayek, a whole, you know, a whole long slew of people to justify a colonial paternalism, essentially. The, the Amerindians, the indigenous peoples of different parts of the world, the people of Africa and so on, lack, by implication, the capacity for self-rule, they lack autonomy, and therefore they must be governed for their own benefit. So that's probably a pretty familiar uh, point, I imagine, to this audience, so we won't need to labor it too much. Um, that means then that for someone like Locke, the great defender of you know, freeborn English liberties and so on, can also perfectly well uh, condone slavery in another part of the world um, and see no particular contradiction in it. And likewise, uh, and perhaps even worse, uh, can't as well. Come back to that in a second. 
So that's a first pretty major restriction. We call it a geographic restriction, um, although it's more than just geography. A second restriction is that uh, at the same time that this idea of consent or autonomy is, is brought into the kind of mainstream of political legitimacy in the 17th and 18th centuries, at the same time, there's an acceptance too, I think, of the need to train and modulate and mold that popular will through a whole set of things that Foucault, for example, spent much of his life analyzing, a whole set of disciplines and techniques and strategies and so on, for essentially shaping not just people's behavior, but the will behind that behavior, what people want. And again, Chris's video kind of broke this in, in the sense of the kind of manipulation of people's appetites and desires and all of this kind of traces back at least to Bernays and Lippmann and on now into the kind of contemporary algorithmic manipulation of of, of our desires and wants and so on. And I, I think it would be pretty easy to show that over time there's a kind of growing intensification of these techniques, a kind of growing penetration into the very will of the, of the person or people um, whose consent now can be manipulated more or less directly. So without going into a huge amount of detail on that, uh, with Hobbes, for example, uh, it's still pretty crude. You know, he admits that you can't get inside people's thoughts. He says there's a secret, a secret train of of thinking that goes on behind people's actual overt behavior. You can't, get, you can't get at that. You can't govern their actual religious beliefs, their conscience. Um, you have to admit that this is sort of beyond your reach. What you can do, and it's enough as far as Hobbes is concerned, is you can put a suitably intimidating gun to their head and give them a choice between obedience or death. And as long as the gun is sufficiently intimidating, well, then job done as far as uh, government is concerned. But it's a pretty major limitation. And you could argue that a lot of political theory since Hobbes has been designed to precisely overcome this, to find a way of getting at people's inner thoughts, so to speak, so that beliefs and conscience are no less uh, inaccessible or no, you know, no more inaccessible to pol political manipulation than overt behavior. Already by Rousseau's time, uh, Rousseau will say you know, that, uh, that the, the laws that matter most are the ones that, that strike at people or get at people's hearts, the, the laws that people love, and he says, for example, that although it's good to know how to use people as they are, you know, to understand people's actual current behavior and to, under, you know, to accommodate yourself to that, this is in the Discourse on Political Economy, he says, it's much better, quote, to make them what one needs them to be. And the most absolute authority is that which penetrates to man's inmost being and affects his will no less than it does his actions. So the kind of authority that, that Rousseau is interested in this is obviously a rather double-edged sword, is a, a, an authority that penetrates then our inmost being, affects our wills no less than it does our actions. Okay, and that's then the key. How to, how to allow, as he puts it in a fragment, morals to penetrate internally and to direct wills, end quote. That's from one of the political fragments. Okay, so that's a, that's a second, so we have a, then a geographic restriction, now we have a, a second kind of in, internal restriction, an, an internal kind of shaping of, of the will itself. And finally, in the third restriction, uh, and in some ways, although the, not anything like as obnoxious as the first two, perhaps ultimately we'll see, but perhaps in the future more far-reaching one, is a, a restriction that operates in terms of the atomization or privatizing of the will, you know, of the domain of autonomy. And this is perhaps then the most salient feature of the concept in, in contemporary usage, the restriction of autonomy uh, and of the will to the domain of merely personal concerns or freedoms. Um, and uh, this again, a big long story, um, and where well, you could track it back to uh, very ancient understandings, I think, of the need to atomize and break up um, people if you want to control them well. I do you, I think you find versions of this in, in, in Augustine, certainly then later in the Reformation, um, and then all the way through the broadly liberal uh, tradition, the kind of possessive individualism that McPherson used to write about in relation to Hobbes and Locke and other early capitalist thinkers, down to the neoliberal project, which is very much, I think, centered on this idea. Um, so without going into that too much, we have then these three dimensions uh, uh, that restrict the sphere of autonomy geographically, internally, and in terms of its scope restriction to the, the kind of private sphere. And already then an, an agenda for, you know, for recuperating a properly political concept of autonomy would be to take those three restrictions and to overturn them, to overcome them, to break them apart, to break them down. 
to eliminate each of those restrictions to have something more like a fully generalized concept of autonomy. And that's still, I think, a, a political project worth pursuing. Um, but without uh, going into that uh, now, what I'd like to do is sort of take a step backwards and look for a second at the kind of philosophically the three kind of most interesting points of reference, particularly taking up that last point, the way that the, the domain of autonomy is effectively privatized or at least abstracted from the relational domain. Remember I said that the, the idea of, of, of the, the autos of, of the self of autonomy is fundamentally a relational characteristic or relational dimension. Uh, and that it, it's striking that the figure who, who both puts it at the very forefront of the agenda, who can be said to have invented the term, according to Schneebin and various others, uh, in its modern usage is Kant. Uh, Kant makes autonomy the critical concept of his moral philosophy. But at the same time, he abstracts it from this relational dimension. At least I think he mostly does. Um, so without, again, going into tons of detail uh, on this, um, uh, and this I'm sure is very familiar, Kant um, defines autonomy, quote, as the property of the will by which it is a law to itself. Okay, which is pretty, un in a way, uncontroversial. That's sort of what the term means. Autonomy, the property of the will by which it's a law to itself. So this capacity to lay down the law to itself, a capacity for self-legislation, is the capacity that Kant thinks that makes us special or distinctive rational agents. Other animals, he assumes, does not, do not have this capacity, but we do have it. And it, this allows us then to be properly moral beings by laying down, working out universal laws and acting in accordance with them, treating therefore everyone as an element or a member in the kingdom of ends and so on. And it's, the, it's that law-giving capacity, he says, this is all from the groundwork of the metaphysics of morals, this law-giving capacity which determines all worth. It's this autonomy or law-giving capacity that's, that makes us unconditionally, incomparably worth, uh, worthy or, 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 or worth with, with, a, with a kind of irreducible dignity. Um, so, and then from that he will say, so given this capacity, given autonomy, the capacity to lay down a law and act on it, he, he then will go on famously also to say, well, that, that capacity can only work if we presuppose a freedom from other sorts of laws or influences. A freedom, then a radical, absolute freedom to be able to lay down the law. But that, he says, we can only ground as the presupposition of our autonomy, our capacity to be law-giving. We know we have that capacity, or at least we can act on it. And because that capacity seems clear, we can also infer that we must be free, transcendentally free, in order to be able to act on such a capacity. Um, but that remains a kind of mere, in a sense, mere presupposition. You can't have any direct experience or proof of it, or at least not much direct experience of it. And what really matters then is this autonomy, precisely. And given that, then he can say that autonomy, what else is the autonomy, you know, autonomy, you know, or what else is freedom but this same autonomy? What else can freedom of the will be but autonomy, he says, the property that the will has of being a law into itself? Or again, a free will and a will under moral laws are one and the same. So given the primacy of autonomy, then we can assume an account of freedom as a presupposition of that autonomy. And the last part of the, the groundwork is caught up with working this out. Um, so uh, let's, in a nutshell, Kant's accounts, I'm sure you know. The problem with it, there are two problems at least, uh, and broadly they're the, the same problem, which is that, well, of course, as Hegel points out and many people since, is that it's totally abstracted from the social and relational domains. So that the question of the actor, the who it is that is the self of this autonomy, this, this person who works out what they should do and, and you know, on the basis of it being the same for everybody else, is indifferently a he, with typically the pronoun that Kant uses, a you know, man, or anyone, or everyone, or the universal, universal reason as such, where what might be between this he and universal reason in a certain sense doesn't really matter because the he just acts as an instance of universal reason. So the, the relational domain, domain that might apply some, in some sense between these things or apply in, in the relations that might uh, pertain between this he and other he's or she's or 
the social relations that shape the society in which this actor is operating, all of that is abstracted away. And it leaves this account uh, as an account of absolute freedom, certainly, but one that's totally abstract, that has no clear social purchase on it. This is broadly Hegel's point. He makes it repeatedly in all kinds of contexts. Um, and I think it's a pretty strong objection. So it, what, what it leaves you with is indeed a very strong sense of a moral imperative, a, an ought to what you ought to do, a kind of pure moral obligation. And it's one that applies, though, precisely without any reference to the question of who the the, the self or the we are, that question of who the autos is. And one of the consequences of this is my second point of, about Kant is that it opens the door, not just opens the door, but arguably, uh, well, let's just say opens the door to his notorious uh, exclusion uh, uh, along racial lines. So this is a, Kant's racism has become a quite, you know, almost a sort of subfield in itself. There's been a lot of work since Emmanuel Eze and Robert Bernasconi began writing about it some time ago now. But it is a very strong objection, I think. Not that he says explicitly that um, there are certain people excluded from the kingdom of ends or that when a, a, a moral actor should act in such a way as, uh, as the principle of their action should apply equally to everybody. He, he doesn't explicitly undercut that in his moral works, like the groundwork. But in his anthropology and some of his essays about race, he provides a whole set of arguments that would allow you to infer uh, that he limits the domain of humanity, at least in its full expression, uh, to white people, simply. Um, so he quite emphatically says that the white race is the perfection of humanity. It's the race that received the full gift of human dignity and full moral worth, full moral capacity and personhood, such that the other quote-unquote races, who he specifies according to skin color primarily, Native American, African, Asian, and so on, are represented as irrevocably and essentially inferior, as less gifted, less apt for moral action, and therefore by implication at least, I think it's a bit more than implication, less, uh, less human. So that, uh, um, uh, whether or not now you, you say that that follows from the concept of, of autonomy that Kant has, I think would be a stretch, but it doesn't, his concept of autonomy, precisely because it doesn't address the relational dimension. It doesn't address the, the question of the relations that might apply between different groups of humans or different human beings in different places. Certainly opens the door to it and arguably does more than that. Um, but perhaps we can come back to that later. Out of Kant then, uh, if we agree that we need to escape the impasse of Kant's um, non-relational conception of autonomy. There are two broad ways forward, two, uh, two dominant ways forward, I would say, and I'm gonna, for simplicity, link them to Hegel on the one hand and Rousseau on the other, in order to come down at the end on the side of Rousseau and people who, who've, and there's some here in the audience who've had to listen to me in classes and so on, are not gonna be very surprised about that. Um, uh, and it's gonna be very schematic because I'm aware that, well, that time is coming running a little bit short. Um, can I just double check and make sure that everybody's um, still able to hear me in this silence and void? Can someone type yes? <laughs> Thank you. Thank you very much. Okay. Um, all right. So if, if we go, if we go to, to Hegel, um, so Hegel's philosophy, and I'm going to talk mainly about this philosophy of right, uh, which is a book that is very important for the project I've been pursuing on the will of the people now for a long time. And if you know the philosophy of right, you'll know that the whole thing is a book about, in a sense, although he doesn't use the word much, about, but about autonomy in the sense of he wants to look at how the will, initially understood as a kind of abstract individual will, a bit like Kant's will, and sometimes explicitly like Kant's will, how it can come to acquire something like the capacity to lay down, to participate in something like state legislation or in a self-governing state, where it would be, at least in some sense, uh, part of the kind of self-governing um, exercise of the state itself. And his specific question, the one that he comes back to and poses specifically as a modern question, distinguishing himself from, the, from antiquity, is how to acknowledge the individual dimension of the will or autonomy, if you like, the individual particularity of the subjective freedom of an individual, while also ensuring that this individuality is integrated into the state in such a way as to broadly submit to the logic of the state and accept it, and indeed affirm it and embrace it. And ultimately to will the, in a sense, to make, to make sure that the individual wants and wills what the state wants and wills. 
it really boils down to something pretty much as simple as that, I think. How to ensure that this initially abstract individual who could will anything he or she wants, actually, and using that word in the Segalian sense, with in, in actuality, comes to will only what the state wants. And that's done materially, if you like, by putting, making sure that people live in a society structured by suitable estates and occupations. People have their place as farmers or merchants or artisans or bureaucrats and are members of suitably sanctioned corporations uh, that give them a, a well-defined and specific function and place in society. And then it's done internally and arguably more importantly by something like the disposing of their will, it uses this term, the disposition of the citizens by the cultivation of patriotic and religious forms of uh, discipline, essentially. Um, and the upshot of all of this is that suitably um, socialized uh, individuals and actors will, as I say, or want what the state essentially wants. Um, and among other things, they come to accept that the state and its foundation, its constitution, is itself sacred and beyond all critique and certainly beyond all contestation. So he'll say in the whole range of places, the famous formulations of the state is the march of God on earth, a, a sacred or divine institution. Something that in any case is certainly beyond any contestation, particularly any contestation by a mass or popular actor. He says, for example, it's utterly essential. This is uh, paragraph 273, the remark to 273, if you want to find it in the philosophy of right. He says, it's essential that the constitution should not be regarded as something made you know, something man-made, like human-made, even if it does have an origin in time. On the contrary, it's quite simply that which has being in and for itself and should therefore be regarded as divine and enduring and as exalted above the sphere of all manufactured things. This is really fundamental to his whole understanding of the state. The state is divine, enduring, exalted, not made, but in some kind of curious sense, like a, an expression of the absolute itself. And as such, can, uh, can uh, uh, essentially accommodate this domain of, of, of the individual by aligning and disposing individuals uh, in such a way as to, uh, that they defer to the logic of the state and embrace it. Um, so one of the interesting features then uh, of Hegel's philosophy, of political philosophy, philosophy of right, is that he disperses the lawmaking dimension, so the, the literally autonomous uh, function of the constitution across the state as a whole. So rather than say have a well-defined executive over here, uh, you know, and a judiciary there, and then the legislative here, and you know, working out the relationship between these different things, there is a there are the estates do function as a kind of representative house. So at least one of the one of the estates, the second estate, the commercial estate, has a representative function. But the legislature isn't just that; it also includes. Um, the executive too, and the, which itself includes the judiciary. Uh, and it really, the lawmaking function is the state as a whole, always on the assumption that there can be no real tension between the different elements of the state because they are fundamentally an organic whole uh, that wills the same central thing. What's critical is not the way that, say, people could initiate new laws or change the state or remake the state, that's like the absolute no no for Hegel, um, but rather that which would facilitate the smooth and further evolution of the laws, as he puts it, paragraph 298. You know, progressively tweak the thing, okay, but, but only in the sense that maintains, you know, its, its essential integrity. And on that basis, you know, you can ensure that people are fundamentally, um, if not servile, at least willing, um, uh, willingly obedient members of the state. And what this excludes then is anything like what Rousseau will champion, which is the idea of, of something like a popular sovereign, a mass sovereign, who, which, whose action would start precisely with the remaking or making of a new state, which would consolidate for itself actual legislative power, lawmaking power, and do all the things required to make those laws stick. So I'm running out of time now, and, and this is also probably pretty familiar um, stuff. But that, I think, is the crux of what Rousseau is talking about. This is then an alternative route out of and away from Kant. Of course, then, in a certain sense, a, a route backwards from Kant. And I do want to stress that it's important to see the limitations of Rousseau's position. Uh, first of, you know, his misogyny, his historical uh, 
parochialism, his lack of any sense of the future. I mean, all this, his, his total indifference to chattel slavery and other things, I and mean, he has many problems. But what he does do, I think, usefully, is emphasize the primacy of, of and he, although he never uses the word autonomy, as far as I can remember, um, of popular lawmaking, or, or, or precisely the, the process whereby people can be a law unto ourselves, acquire the capacity to assemble, combine, associate, uh, to be able to work out what a law should be, and then to apply it to all the members of the community or the situation, meaning and particularly those with an interest to, to resist it, the rich and the various institutions that serve the rich. So without really going into that too much here, again, this is pretty standard Rousseau. Um, what he further emphasizes is that the, the, the key conditions that must be met in order to be able to do this, to, to, to actually exercise our autonomy in this political sense, to be law-giving, a law-giving uh, sovereign democracy. Uh, although he doesn't use the word democracy per se because he restricts that to government, but, but this is broadly what he means, um, popular sovereignty. The, the two key conditions to be able to do this are first to invent or develop the forms of association required for people to actually be our community, to find a way to be together despite all the obstacles, and he's not, he doesn't pretend that there aren't obstacles to association, but to, to invent forms of association. So that could literally, and he does talk about this, mean coming together in a particular place, combining in a, in a spot, but it can mean many other things too, of course, industrial combinations, trade unions, political parties, nations, international forms, uh, pan-African movements, you know, tri-continental movements and so on. Um, so first of all, to invent an adequate form of association for combining a people together. And it's that that puts a limit on the generality of a general will. A will can generalize itself as far as it can associate, essentially. And although Rousseau, again, for his anachronistic historical, you know, lack of a historical imagination, thinks that you can't really do that very far, there's no real reason. It all depends on how far, precisely how, how capable we are of expanding our sphere of association and in particular expanding it beyond that first limitation that I mentioned, that geographic limitation that was so important to Locke and the, the colonial thinkers I mentioned before. So that's the first thing. The second is to, and I'll end with this, is the capacity we must have to concentrate our power. So Rousseau, this is a line I've quoted, I can't think how many times, but I do think it's important and I'll quote it again from the social contract. He says, the people's force acts only when concentrated. It evaporates and is lost as it spreads, like the effect of gunpowder scattered on the ground, which ignites only grain by grain. And in this little formula, I do think we can find a lot of the pieces we need to study both the way power works, the way the actual so-called democracies work today, the way they scatter us, the way they disperse our power, so that we become harmless little grains of gunpowder, so to speak. And also the a kind of principle of what we then need to do for to reclaim and exercise our sovereignty, our, our autonomy, how we need to reinvent forms of concentration. Rousseau himself is not going to do that for us, of course. The, to do this, to work out how best to do it, we need resources that are well beyond Rousseau. But we can do worse, I think, than by starting with Rousseau. So I'll end there.